Good morning, Tuvalu, and welcome to Star Trek Picard, Season 3, Episode 3, 17 Seconds. Uh, which, I, I have to admit, it felt quite a bit longer to me. Um, I don't really know what's up with that, but it did feel more than 17 seconds. Um, I also thought, hey, wouldn't it be nice to, like, instead of the TNG engine hum, because, you know, th this isn't TNG, instead of putting this hum on, what if I get, like, the Defiant? Um, but it, I, I didn't have time to find one before I hit go live, and of course I can't go switching through engine hums while we're live. Um, the reason I didn't have time is because I spent like the 10 minutes between finishing the episode and streaming, uh, pu putting up this little thing, working on something in Photoshop, hang on. I just need to add an image layer to OBS, um, and then here we go, there it is. Uh, and then let's see, let's rotate it a bit, uh, scale it, and, uh, yeah, I think... Did you make a sticky note that says yes. I was wrong? Uh, I, I'm not on camera this time, but once again, I, I, after, of course, that time in Strange New Worlds, Spock Amok, I famously wrote I was wrong on a sticky note and put it on my forehead for the full review. Uh, hang on, I just realized that's... Ooh, that's... Yeah, that's not gonna go. Um, yes. I very much enjoyed this episode. <laughs> this was the best episode of the season. Um, I didn't say that I wasn't going to enjoy it. That's not why we've got a sticky note on my head. Um... If, if you recall, I've been saying, oh, and yes, as you heard, Alex is here, uh, so we're going to dance around proper nouns uh, once again. But um, There, I turned my stream all the way up. There we go. Yes, I'm streaming while Alex is watching an unrelated stream, so uh, hopefully th that works. Um, yes, if you recall, is um, I was talking where I didn't... I, I couldn't see how Dr. Crusher could keep the secret she was keeping, and um, I, I just didn't think you could do it. I said, maybe, I, you know, you, I, I'll kind of wait to hear the justification. I, I said it's what I said for Q, where I, I, I don't see how they're going to earn it, but, um, you know, this was the episode that gave that justification, and I had that that deserves the uh, good old I was wrong sticky note. Uh, we don't break that out for any just anything. Um, but no, I found this episode very entertaining, as I said. Um, very few complaints, actually. I think I really just have one, two that are basically one. Um, yeah, you know, that instead of maybe like a nitpick I could find. But... Um, I, I thought this episode was entertaining. You know, it had a good, solid story. It had a plot. But really, what, what caught me about this episode um, is I, I I thought the character uh, writing, the character work, and in particular the character motivations were very, um, very well done. You know, with, with two little exceptions in which we don't actually know the character motivation. So... Every time we, like, know a character well enough to understand their motivations and what they're doing, I was like, yep, no, I get exactly why, even if it's not being spelled out, why this character's doing this thing, why they're doing what they're doing, why why they're in this um, position. I, which, it feels weird to praise it, like, it's... It's not like, oh, you did, you know, above and beyond. That's kind of what you're supposed to do in writing. But there was just a lot of it. Um, and I thought it was really well done and pleasantly surprising after um, some of the last things I've seen this writing team do. So let's finally kill off the engine hums. Have you noticed them getting quieter? I, I like to think I do it really slow and stealthily. <laughs> uh, and let's transition to directed by Jonathan Frakes. Uh, why, why is it not working? It's the wrong button. There we go. Let's I'll tell you what. Let's keep that guy uh, up there <laughs> just just for now. Stress VK. Awesome. I could not be prou uh, prouder of Beverly after watching her face down John Luke and stand her ground. Uh, Stress VK. Yes, I was kind of, I'm kind of hoping there is one person in chat who didn't like this episode cuz I think is a collective um, we've been uh, more on the negative side on this series we haven't been enjoying it too much and 
we've had a lot of the complaints um, of, like, consistency of character and whatnot. And I was kind of hoping to talk about someone who's like, if this didn't work for you, why? Um, but I, that's a good sign if maybe we're, we're more on the same, same page. Um, it was kind of a moment. It, let's just skip to that one. The, the big part of the, ep- well, you know, first off, I was going to say the big part of the episode. Um, I'm not even sure if this is the big part of the episode. <laughs> that might be the end. Um, the whole why I want defiant engine hums. Um, but no, let's go with this bit. Um, yeah, like, I could not see any way you could possibly justify, um, this whatsoever. And then as soon as she said, yeah, I can't even remember what her first line, like, of why she didn't tell Picard, I'm like, damn it, yeah, Dr. Crusher is a mother. That's, like, her main character, like, our, her more def- most definitive character trait, beyond, like, doctor, beyond the need to help, beyond the do no harm, help everyone you meet, is I'm a mother. <laughs> that is that is her number one character trait, and there are so many times, every episode, not every episode, but so many TNG episodes where she's like, yes, I am doing this thing because my son is on board and my son is in danger and my sole focus here is to protect my son. I'm like, it was kind of like the, yeah, I, how come I didn't think of that? You know, like, here, hang on, it's, you know, just, does, does she deserve an Iro song sticker? Who <laughs> do we put this on? Like, no, let's put it here as we say this next point. Like, as I talk about this scene, um, I don't want to say, like, that Dr. Crusher did the right thing, that Picard did, is in the right, that Crusher's in the right, like, they're arguably both wrong, and they're arguably both right, but from, like, a is this actually, like, a course of action that makes sense for this character? I think both these characters are, um, correct. Like, bo- both these characters are right to be upset. Obviously, Picard is right to be upset. Picard had a right to know. Um, but Crusher it absolutely would have done everything possible to protect her kid. And, um, with... What's the gap, actually? I should check. I guess we don't know when Dr. Crusher left the Enterprise 20 years ago. 2380. So yeah, I think we're looking a little bit after Nemesis, um, which I think is 10 years before the Nova. Um, so actually, maybe our timelines are a little bit messy here. Um, but who knows? Picard Picard probably did make enemies um, after Nemesis in the Romulan Empire. I'm getting sidetracked, though. But um, yeah, Stars VK, you saw that coming because of how she was with the Edo. I should have. I absolutely should have. It's just one of those things where it's like, oh, yeah, she's a mother. That's her That's her big thing. But um, yeah, um, Dr. Crusher, absolutely. This it just makes sense. This, is, this would justify cutting everyone out of her lives. This would justify, uh, I mean, not necessarily justify in its right, but justify, like, no, not only is this something this character would do, this is the only thing this character would do. And they would struggle with it, but they would do it. Um, you know, Picard gets angry, like, maybe I would have done something different if you told me. Um, he's like, maybe I would have left. But he's like, no. Um, if we're talking, like, right after Nemesis, he might have. Um, I suppose maybe he would have left the Enterprise. Um, but if, like, his life is in danger and this sort of stuff because of the Nova, um, because of the Romulan supernova, he wouldn't have left. He he just wouldn't. That's not the kind of person Jean-Luc Picard is. Um, he absolutely would have stayed in Starfleet. And if there was any sort of place he could help, you know, and anything like that. That's the kind of man Picard is, is he would have stayed in Starfleet. Um, if, if there was some downside, he might, he probably would have left, but then, you know, if he left Starfleet, and then, after Nemesis, and then, like, d- d- seven years later, he got a call, and he's like, Captain Picard, Romulan son's about to go Nova. It's like, we need all the help you could. He would have gotten, he would have, he wouldn't have even gotten that call. He would have got up and started to help. Um, and yeah, I love as well that they added the line that like once um, he was old enough, you know, once Jack was old enough, uh, Crusher told him and even was like pressured him to go meet Picard. I think she even said pressured him because, um, yeah, that 
at that point then i we don't know what old enough is i'd imagine an adult you know but like it 18 it's like i'm it's it it's wrong for her to then be like no i've got to protect him from like everything at this point and she knows it uh despite always being a mother you know who and as she said a mother who lost friends who lost her husband who um quote unquote lost um more you know it's like it, it absolutely no they they definitely if there's one thing this team can do it's take their core ideas and then earn them <laughs> um but yeah this this sold me and this is why i've got the i was wrong little sticker on there everything about that scene was great um the only part about this i still don't really understand um and this is my kind of complaint uh is jack right here i don't really understand jack's motivations here um they haven't been explained to us like that that's the key thing of course um is that sticky note in the top right corner is showing it's important to like wait till the things are explained but um there's also all scenes like i don't get why jack is angry at picard um picard has absolutely no knowledge of the situation whatsoever could never have gained knowledge of the situation and had no way of knowing there was a problem and jack knows this like if jack should be angry at someone why isn't it his mother um why does jack want to avoid picard uh i'm i'm just not getting it um I'm sure it'll be explained in a few episodes, probably. That seems like a big, <laughs> kind of a big moment later on. Um, and then similarly, in this episode particularly, some of Picard's motivations, I, I'm i not really sure on. Like, why is Picard so big on an offensive course of action with this um, Vatic? That's her name. I don't really understand it. Because if you think it's just to protect his family, well then why why isn't he getting the heck out of there? Like, go sit your butt on Earth space dock and let the Starfleet, well, fleet, protect you. Um, that was one I didn't, I didn't really get. But other than that, yeah, I, I absolutely get Riker here. Very capable captain, very good. Um, it makes sense. His course of actions, his motivations with Thaddeus and everything. It, um, I get why he's doing what he's doing. I get why he's trying to do what he's doing for Picard. Alex, you really need to find a hobby. <laughs> like, oh. You really need to find a hobby between noon and one on Saturdays. It's so hard. You do have a hobby. You just need to fuck right off. <laughs> it's so hard. Um, <laughs> what so Dancing good. around proper nouns. Um I, we knew this would be a difficult season, but hey, we, we should have a house. I was going to say by season four. That's not going to happen, but by the equivalent, by when season four would have been. Um, I liked as well this scene. Sorry, I paused there. Is this Guinan's bar? Um, I think it's definitely the same set as Guinan's bar, but it's kind of weird that Picard in season two would have visited Guinan's bar, saw a 10 forward sign, and been like, oh, that's so funny, because see, she had a bar on the Enterprise called 10 forward. It's like, you knew this, evidently. Um, that's, we're getting sidetracked, sorry, but, um, it's just VK. Beverly told Jack all about the TNG crew. Uh, not quite, but since Picard never even chose to look up his mom, then good riddance. The thing is, though, um, she would sometimes start telling him about the crew, and then she'd get too sad to. But I would imagine that Beverly told Crush, told Jack that she never told Picard. Picard does not know. Picard is completely ignorant in this situation. That is why she doesn't talk about the TNG crew anymore. Like, how does this not come up? <laughs> um, especially when she tells Jack the truth. How does that not come up? Um, I, I can see, and I might even expect, he's angry at Picard for not putting more of an effort to recontact Dr. Crusher, but why 
would he? It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, rational, um, the anger. But again, from Picard's perspective, the only other person involved in this whole scenario is Beverly. And Beverly has very clearly made an active decision to say, go away and never talk to me again. Like, why would he... Like, why would he want to try and go against that? But also, um, I completely lost my second point, and it was the main point. <laughs> um, God, I... I don't know. Um, I've lost that. Like, now, I, I, and I get, as well, I like that Jack specifically d chose not to talk to Picard, and Picard knows that, and that is one of the main reasons why Picard isn't now talking to Jack. Because from Picard's perspective, why would he? I mean, he probably wants to, and yes, it's Picard. He doesn't know what to do, he'd be awkward, he doesn't know what to say, how to be, yada yada. But he now knows, again, that Jack made an active choice to tell Picard, I want nothing to do with you. And so Picard's like, okay, that's your choice. Like, I hate it, and it sucks. He probably should have acknowledged that, been like, hey, your mother told me you want nothing to do with me, but if you change, I'm going to respect that, but if I change, you change your mind, I'm here. That's what he should have said, but this is Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> he doesn't really know how to handle these kind of situations. So, again, great character motivation. Stress VK, uh, but Jack knows his mom and Picard, uh, I wouldn't say that, Stress VK. I don't think we know the details of what happened after, um, the Mind Sherry episode, which was very late in season seven. Um, that's not the, the, um, that's not what I got from that description. That description was very much like we're busy people and our lives aren't um, aren't inducive to a relationship like this. And we, we keep trying because we both want it, but it's just not working because of who we are. And it's not going to work. That was the one I got. Um, I mean, it, it was an issue of time. Like, there's always the ticking clock. And like, yeah, w when I was in college with Alex, like, we would... I, I was 300 miles away. And so every time I saw them, it's like a weekend where there's always the ticking clock of the train home or the flight home or whatever. I say home, back to the university. Um, so, and the seven years before that point as well of Next Generation are not that at all. Um, they've both always, from what we see on screen, been very respectful to each other. Um, and I can't see, I, I just can't see that, um, sort of one night sand thing from those two. All right. <laughs> oh, I, I will say, that's what I was going to say before I read the comments. Um, this episode as well, got a lot of, like, I, I really like the writing. It kind of, the, the interactions between the crew, um, there's some that got good chuckles out of me. I love this bit, um, just the speech about, like, he'll be raised by some loving character, like, your mother, his mother. It's just that one, that one got a laugh out of me. Later on, um, you, I think, Will, I think it's about time you call me number one. Decapitations are on Wednesdays. Like, come on, that right there. I'm sure that's got to be a classic Star Trek line from Worf. Um, I'm, I really hope the line, I... Uh, like, I, I love this. I, I'm, I'm enjoying, it's not what I expected, but I'm enjoying this kind of transitional wharf where he's he's working towards a more, um, he doesn't know it, I think, but he's working towards that pacifist wharf and he's becoming more tempered in that wisdom with age. And so I love the idea that he's kind of weaning, him, like, like an addict, you know, kind of lowering the dose of um, drugs or whatever as they... Uh, try and wean off their addiction he's like okay i will only decapitate people on wednesdays and then you know it's it, it, like it used to be tuesdays and wednesdays and like w monday to wednesday but slowly goes down and like i i really hope like the line i thought after that my follow-up is that like in an episode it's like sunday pacifism is a sunday is a pacifism day you know or like 
Sundays are pacifist day. It's like he just doesn't do anything on Sundays. And I love the idea of a crew having to work around Worf's weird morality schedule. <laughs> like, that, that, if that's, that's just, I love that setup. It's amazing. Um, I'm not too happy with his very pessimistic view on the world. Um, I'm not going to say it's necessarily um, totally out of character. Um, I mean, it's pessimistic. I, I, you never like the words pessimistic in Star Trek together. Um, I think there's definitely an interpretation of it that a more looser interpretation or like memory that I'll kind of think about more and have a sort of a headcanon. But um, I, Worf was so much better than the like big warrior boy on, <laughs> on last week. Trust VK, uh, kids can be very black and white. So from Jack's perspective, Picard should have checked in to see how his former. Yes, um, it's it's very irrational though. Um, like again, you you can have an irrational character. It's just so extremely irrational to someone who would just live their whole life um, without. Of all the, and I, I want to say seemingly fine, but we've we've never. I mean, I guess we don't know that. But um, it's Jack doesn't seem like an irrational man to me. Um, like it is a bunch of things outside of my experience from every viewpoint. But I, I'm gonna. It's gonna need a good explanation for me to really understand why is this character acting like this. Um, cause I, I expect you're right. It's just, you know, maybe you, you need the right words to like actually explain it. Um, rather than just saying, this is why he's upset. You need that kind of emotion behind the lines, whatever. Like the, Beverly's motivations, you could have said, oh, she's a mom who cares about her kids. I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. But you give me this, like, two, three-minute exchange between the two of them, and yeah, that's a perfectly solid, like, great character beat that makes perfect sense and is the exact same thing, just with more words. Hmm. Uh, do, do, do. What else have we got? Oh, yeah, um, we had that family thing come up again. We'll probably do a scene-by-scene scene after this point. Um, it's another thing about character motivation where Jack Crusher finds out what's going on. Um, where the heck is he? You know, somewhere around here. Jack finds out what's going on. He tries to go to the bridge and warn Riker. Because I guess I've realized, again, no one in this series, um, phones ahead. <laughs> we should keep a tally of how many lives could be saved if people in this show just use communicators instead of walking to their destination. <laughs> <laughs> um ooh, I'm gonna sidestep my point here because uh Fay Boy, I think I hope you're pronouncing your name right. I probably did not. Uh has a point here. You know Deep Space Nine was a very pessimistic show about the events that happened to Worf on that show would tend to make him a bit gloomy. Oh, absolutely. You could take a um post Deep Space Nine, post Nemesis Worf, and put take his life in so many directions. There's a K less on um on the capital, on Kronos. Uh, yes, I forgot the name for a second. Um, you know, he's got friends in the Federation, friends in the Dominion. Um, you know, look at where his friends went after Nemesis. You, you could take Worf basically any way you want. Um, but I will challenge that Deep Space Nine... Um, because I, I was thinking about this the other day where, like... Star Trek should be optimistic, I think. Um, Star Trek definitely should be optimistic. And there are certain seasons of um, various modern shows that have fallen short, I feel. You know, kind of the common ones. Early Discovery, um, you know, Picard in a lot of ways. This season's still up in the air. Um, but I don't... Th Deep Space Nine really skirts that line because it's a very dark time. It is a very dark time, Deep Space Nine. There are very dark situations. Um, there are definitely episodes. A, R, 115, whatever, um, is just depressing. 
Um, you know, that's probably the biggest example. There's not really optimism in that episode. It's like, hey, these people are kind of neglected on the front line. What's the resolution? They're still neglected and dying for this rock on the front line. And now Nog doesn't have a leg. That's like the resolution. Um, and there's definitely more of that faltering. But I feel if, if the Federation's, like, worldview is a gas tank from, like, Empty is 100% pessimistic, and Full is 100% optimistic. Deep Space Nine's kind of one that, like, teeters around the 50% mark, where, like, sometimes it dips a bit below, but it bounces back. It's like, we, we can't do this. Like, this is a really dark time, but we can come out of it better, and we can come out and start rebuilding. Whereas something like um, Picard... Uh, it's like the earlier seasons of Picard. The characters aren't even necessarily that pessimistic. Like, I don't think Picard has ever been pessimistic, but the world, like the, the government of the Federation itself, feels very much like a government, very much like the modern day, where it has very old, very rooted systemic problems that are negatively impacting the world. Like, right now, the, the Federation is actively covering up um, a massive terrorist incident, saying, like, oh, we, we don't think it'll ever happen again. Like, you do. You, you know this isn't the guy. <laughs> like, you know there's no reason that it can't happen again. If it happens again, it's just gonna be even worse, because now you said this thing's never gonna happen again, and then it did. Um, you, you have a federation that often kind of feels like it gives up, or it's like, yeah, the galaxy's a shitty place, and we just gotta deal with it. Not like, no, you know, our neighbors might be bad, but by God, we're the beacon of hope, and we're gonna stick to those ideals. Um, and that's kind of the difference, where the federation government itself would get desperate, but it would still, it would teeter, it might kind of wonder like are we actually going to make it out of this but it would still go it would still come back to that like yes we will and it's going to suck getting through it but we will get out of this stress vk uh fortunately Worf has dipped into more zen philosophy from earth um yes i like that it's very common with aliens uh, in star trek the elder vulcans have a very different and arguably more correct interpretation of Sarak's uh, teachings than anyone else. Um, we haven't seen too many Elder Klingons, but from what we've seen of Kaelas, and from what I remember, honestly, of the Elder Klingons, Worf is another one of those examples where it's a more, it's a very different, more subdued, but arguably more correct interpretation of Kaelas's teachings. Um, I very much enjoy... I enjoy, I really love how Star Trek does alien races, because people will kind of complain a lot that, like, I, this isn't unique to Star Trek, but it is often the example of, like, the Ferengi are capitalists, the, the Romulans are sneaky buggers, the Klingons are military warriors, and, like, the Vulcans are logic-y boys. That, that's, <laughs> do you like my descriptions? Um, that's... And it's like, that's unrealistic, you know, look at Earth. Like, we don't really have that. And it's like, well, exactly, look at Earth. Because you could boil, like, countries and peoples down to these one little word. They're called stereotypes. Like, you can do it. I'm not going to do it here. But pick the big countries, America, England, Russia, China. Like, you could boil them down to, like, really brief one-liner stereotypes but if you're gonna dig in you're gonna find like people are people and it's a whole lot deeper than that it's a whole lot more complex and yeah there are cultural biases uh to certain things definitely but it's a lot deeper and when we look at star trek you know the ferengi start is like comically capitalist greedy little pigs and the more we look at the Ferengi society, you know, that is who we probably see the most out of any alien society, the more complex. They're a fully fleshed out, yes, capitalist society, 
but they have like um you know, a li- big liberal movement underneath them. They've, they've got change. They've got so many things. There's the famous Enterprise line. Like, did you think we were all warriors? We have doctors and chefs and judges. It's like just the warrior class is so exalted and, like, put on a pedestal. And they're the ones the aliens see because they're the ones going out and exploring the galaxy. Um, you know, Vulcans are not emotionalists. They're, they're just not. It's a misunderstanding of, like, the surface level what people see. And I I always love how Star Trek handles these really well, and I don't remember the original point, but this supports that point excellently. Just take my word for it. A lot of talk in the chat going through. Uh, Fa-ba. No, Fa-ba. That's better. Fa-ba is what I'm going to go with now for that name. Kor and Koleth uh, were shown old, but I think for the most part, Klingons don't make it to old age. I vaguely recall something like that, but nowadays I bet they do. Um, We've been pretty peaceful since, like, TNG-ish. Kor, Kang, and Koleth were probably kind of the last generation where it'd be weird if they made it to old age. Nowadays, I bet they they probably do, Dominion War aside. Um... The Ferengi are 1950s us. Yeah, that's what they were. The Ferengi were literally, hey, it's 1980. I'm Gene Roddenberry. What are the worst traits about America? Okay, dial them up to 11, get rid of the good, and that's the Ferengi. (laughs) But um, yeah, their society is a lot more intricate than that, and it still has problems, but it's a society. Anything from the outside is going to look, you know, real... You could boil it down real basic like that until you start digging in. Uh, Going through... The, God, there was something else I was going to bring up. <laughs> Just slipped my mind again. So I think we will probably go through... Oh! No, there is something big, isn't there? The changelings! <laughs> Let's talk about that before doing our little scene-by-scene. Scene. Um, if I can get a changeling on screen there i don't know i don't know you see what i have to deal with there we go there's our changeling um <laughs> yeah i'm i'm looking forward to it um i deep space is how do i word it like the areas of the galaxy deep space nine touched have felt very neglected since deep space nine voyager enterprise all the way on um, it, it's gotten to the point where it almost feels too late to, like, well, what are you gonna do now? Like, we've seen Cardassians, we've seen loads of people, like, it's, it's almost too late to go back to. Um, but I am excited and hopeful for, you know, what's happened to the Dominion? Just give us, give us a little check-in. Um, this is a rogue faction, sure, but, you know, it may come a part of the world again. Like, functionally... Um, a lot of the Dominion races are, like, where Bajor is because of the wormhole. And that's far, but, like, not that far. You know, we see Cardassians all the time. Um, we see Bajorans all the time. Like, the Dominion is a neighbor of the Federation. Let, let's see them. Let's see more stuff. Um, I think that effect, the changeling effect, is a very good, um modern take on it like i don't even want to use the word take like it it's probably pretty similar to what they were imagining um when they did odo which is an effect that holds up very well i mean the wormhole and odo they still hold up today they're just not in hd um perhaps a bit fleshy fleshier than i would have made it at the very end um i'm hoping i could get a little bit up there god knows um oh that was close hang on i'm just gonna (laughs) i want to see can i get the changeling there we go he's gonna come on screen really bit there we go yeah maybe a bit fleshier than i would have done it um here we go you're wrong don't be a terrorist (laughs) but um yeah that's probably about what odo would look like Kind of looks like a duck, actually. Like, his little 
little beak. You can't see my mouse. Oh well, but look, it's like a little duck that's about to kiss Worf. That's what this is a picture of. Uh, I'm bad with pronouncing. Feba, Feba. I was wondering if Riker was a changeling. I don't think so, but uh, I don't think he would act the way he did when he took command of the Titan. Ooh, see, I disagree. Um, if anyone's unreasonable here, I think it's Picard. Um, I think Riker... No, that, that felt like a Riker in command. Um, in a desperate situation, sure. Like, it's not a ship, but um, I, I disagree with you there. Uh, like a red meat egg yolk. It's like a wet... It's not really fleshy. I, I keep struggling to define what it is. But, like, if you kind of took Odo, the, like, changeling -y effect, and put it in HD, th this is what it is. Like, if Deep Space Nine was a video game, um, and you looked at Odo, and you turned on, your like, Minecraft, you hit, like, the enable ray tracing button, <laughs> this is what Odo would look like in <laughs> with ray tracing on. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> Um, I got my Ford RTX 4090 yesterday, and it hasn't exploded yet, so um, that's what's on my mind. I'm going to get a different picture on screen now. Uh, Carlos A. Smith, Picard was a pest as a second officer. Yes. Um, and Riker, I mean, Riker did give a... He did have a point, like, I know you're... I don't remember his words, but, like, there's a lot going on right now. I get that. Um... It's just kind of weird to me how much Picard was pushing for the aggressive tactic. Like, especially well after it was done. I also get he's frustrated for the first time in 40, 50 years probably not being the one in charge. Just what I say goes. Um, it, it's not on, it, it was just a bit odd, but I'm not going to say it's like totally out of character. Um, Fallboy, it reminds me of Kirk and Pike in the last episode of Strange New Worlds. God, you, you really threw me there, because I totally forgot Kirk was in Strange New Worlds. Um, yeah, I, 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 it's been a while since I've seen it, but I think I see where you're going. Um, damn, a 4090, do you live in a mansion or something? I live in one room in my future sister-in-law's basement, which is probably one of the reasons I can afford a 4090. Um, I also had to buy a better power supply unit, but, um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's overpowered. I had a 1080 for, like, the past decade, probably, um, and I finally took a little bit of money from last month, a little bit from this month, and did a bit of a splurge. And in, like, 15 years, maybe I'll have to replace it again. <laughs> um, Carlos A. Smith. Oh, uh, by the way, yeah, Fallboy, Lowell, I still have a 1070. The 4090, like, the 1080 is a big card. The 4090 was bigger than Alex's forearm. Um, it, it's so big, it needs a support to, like, be screwed into the case on the back. It, it's, it, it's, it's insanely big, but... um. I won't have to buy another graphics card for, like, 13 years. Uh, Carlos, and the writing on that part between Riker and Picard uh, was not mature. Um, yeah, it wasn't mature. Um, I think that's what they were going for. I don't... But that's the thing is, I, I don't really get why. I've never been a parent. Um, maybe I'll feel different. What, you, why are you giving me a strange look and I've never been a parent? Is there something you would like it. to sh share? Oh, okay, our dog, yeah. <laughs> like, is there something you'd like to Have you been hi dog? Have you been hiding something from me, Alex? In our if, one room? That's impressive. If I'm pregnant, it's the next Jesus, I'm just saying. Well, it's the, I, I don't think I'd have been a parent until you give birth, so it'd be even more impressive. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I think otherwise, though, that's like, that's an oddity in this episode for me, is otherwise I was very happy with the writing, um, which I know, I, I don't think I've ever said, well, 
No, I've said that about big scenes before in season two for this crew. But um, if if Picard is just kind of this for seven more episodes, I would not be uh, disappointed. Uh, I I can't say I'd be overjoyed or even like, oh, man, that was great. But um, I'd be like, yeah, that was good. You know, it'd be the best season of Picard, certainly. Uh, let's... Do you have a proper table yet? Um, we do have a little fold-up table that the computer's on. Um, we have the kind of, like, uh, what do you call it? Like, the thing that goes in front of a couch that kind of lifts up that I use for the videos, the last reviews. Um, that's not a table. Um, but no. I have a 4090, uh, RTX, but I still don't own a proper table. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, I own a 4090 because I don't buy things like proper tables. So, you know, it, would you want a table or a 4090? It's, it's up to you what kind of person you are. <laughs> Carlos A. Smith, uh, I wasn't about being a parent. Uh, oh yeah, no, it was about control your emotions in a death and life situation. And apparently the frantic... Uh, urging from Picard was not helpful. Yeah, um, I think he's frantic because, as Riker says, he's got a lot on his plate. Um, one of which is the whole parent thing. But um, yeah, I, I think we're I think we're largely in agreement about that section. Uh, also, Riker's comment at the end about like get off the bridge, Admiral. You've killed us all. Like that was another. Come on, Riker. That that bit of professionalism, you know. Um, also, he doesn't know this, but depending on what blew up, he might have just saved you all. Like, if the warp core blew up, could you imagine if they were at warp running away when that went off? Like, they would have all died. <laughs> Mathman4090 for sure. I can render really good tables in real time, right? Like, why would I need a table? You can't build a 4090 out of a table. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, um, which might not be many, the RTX 4090, um, is the best consumer graphics card money can buy and is stupidly overpowered. So that's, <laughs> that's why people are reacting like this. Uh, Fabo, Fe, Fe, Feba, I'm really bad at reading pronunciations. Feba, no more Eagle Moss. I was wondering, uh, what you would do with the channel and you agree. Uh, the plan is, was to go into, they're called the Star Trek main videos on my channel. It's a, the, I think the top playlist, um, I don't know, just look at, it's on the homepage. Um, of more of those, like, theories, um, guides, I don't know, whatever. It, finding the motivation for that is tougher. Um, I do have a modern watch order guide that got to the editing phase and i haven't worked on in a while um but i i do want to get back into that i really want to try and push i, I have a di slightly different setup um to make him go through a bit faster they're not going to be like crazy intense editing things like poorly explained or whatever um eagle moss has been bought by a company in my um uh, community tab, there's, like, a little link. I got an email from some, like, master models or something that they bought a lot of Eagle Moss's licenses and uh, old products um, and are going to go into production eventually. I might pick those up again. We'll see. Um, but I do want to get more into the other style videos, and we'll, we'll see what happens. It's just hard. I work a full-time job. I'm a software engineer. Um... And motivation is just kind of hard for these things anyway for me. But I do really want to get um, get back into them. And I think maybe I just need to start watching Star Trek more. Because I haven't gone through Star Trek in years because of the watch through with Alex. But we're going through so slowly that like... I heard my name. Yeah, those Star Trek watches were going. We're going through Star Trek so slowly that Shut up. I'm not going to touch TNG because that's what we're doing now. But, like, I could go through Deep Space Nine, and we'll probably not be there for, like, a year or two. I don't... They're gonna hear this tape measure, Alex. 
Carlos Why ain't there. You can't. Shit you can't didn't touch the think mic. That I would hear it. <laughs> you can't touch the mic, Alex. Carlos A. Smith, uh, not Riker. Uh, the writers is from the second season of Picard. Yes, they don't have the understanding of a true life and death situation. I, Carlos, I'm gonna go out in a limb here and say that was true for um, probably all the writers of TNG, if not. Most of them. I'm not going to say all, because there were some wars around then, but I think most of the writers probably didn't understand what a true life and death situation is. Um, Stress VK, so if Riker is a changeling, I really don't, I don't think you're right about this, but we'll go on. Um, then Seven and Picard might have to team up to eventually to retake the ship, leaving Shaw to choose which side to fall on. Shaw. Oh, Captain Titan. Why would Captain Titan choose the changelings? I, I, I think I think you're going up the wrong tree. But also, as I was reading that, I remembered that both Lore and Moriarty are in this season, and it's always the thing like, how are we gonna get there? <laughs> like, how are we gonna get from here to Moriarty? Like, I was wondering, watching this, like, how's they going to rope Jordy into this? Because, um, I'll say as well, I think this season's actually done a great job, unlike last season, of justifying why the characters are here. Um, it's a bit of a coincidence, I suppose, that Worf is investigating this quantum tunneling thing. Um, but it gives them a reason to collide with the Titan crew. I guess Seven is arguably the most contrived person to be here. And even then, it's not really like a... Like, it's it's like, yeah, I mean, Seven's on this ship. Whatever. Um, you've done a really good job at giving the people a reason, and they're not just shoving them in. Um, so I've, I've very much enjoyed that. Not TNG, dealing with Picard only. Stay focused, lol. Look, if you're gonna knock these writers for not knowing what a real life and death situation is i'm gonna call out how few of the previous writers did maybe they got it better maybe you think they did but um it's a little unfair to say they've never been in a life and death situation sitting in their writer's room um fa boy your pronunciation has moved off the chat I'm old enough that I've watched all of the episodes when they came out, except TOS. I saw TOS in the 70s when they reran it. Um, I theoretically could have caught Voyager. Uh, I think the la actually, yeah, Voyager went to 2001. So the last bit of Voyager, Nemesis, and Enterprise. But um, I probably saw Enterprise. Yeah, because Enterprise would have been canceled in 09. I definitely saw... Wait, that's not right. Enterprise was cancelled in 05. I might have been watching TOS with Dad before it was cancelled, but, like, I didn't... You think I knew what Star Trek Enterprise was at that age? Like, um... I probably didn't know there was more than TOS. I didn't really get into it. Well, I liked it with Dad, but, um... 2015, I think it would have been, is when I got, I was finally sat down and was like, right, I'm going to watch this TNG thing, and we're going to go through the rest of Star Trek. Um, but yeah, it's, God, there was another thing I was going to segue into that I've forgotten. I, I should really start taking notes again. Uh, yeah, let's go through. I'll say, uh, the Titan isn't bothering me as much, um is a ship. Uh, I, I don't like its story, but um, it is settling in more as, like, a, a ship. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. What more do I want to say about that? It's not like Raffi, where every time on the screen, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're in the show. Just VK, I really want Vatic uh, to be a hollow. Ooh, due to her uh, encyclopedic knowledge of everyone. Uh, and Moriarty to have a Vatic to capture Picard's son. I'm not against that idea, especially if it leads into some sort of holographic rights um, message or, like, story. Um, I've just realized, like, there's a potential that 
the big, like, massive conspiracy of Star Trek Picard is literally run by Professor Moriarty. <laughs> Imagine going to, like, someone in the... Like, they just left the Wrath of Khan or something in the theaters in the 70s, 80s, and we're... 70s, yeah. And we're like, hey, one day Professor Moriarty is going to be the main villain of a plot in Star Trek. You're like, what? <laughs> Uh, I think that they were going for a familiar look for the Titan, but the backstory is weak. I agree. Oh, go... I, I think you're new here. Welcome to the channel. I don't know if you've been silent. But go back to my um, episode one review. That's where I did my Titan rant. And then, like, Strange New Worlds, we don't talk about Spock. We don't talk about the Titan. That's just... Uh, <laughs> I, I put that behind me now. But if there's, like, an Eagle Moss model of it, I would have gotten it, you know. Oh my goodness, David C., thank you for finally confirming that that uh, is super chat is set up correctly. Uh, just leaving this here to say thanks for all your reviews. There we go. Thank you so much, David C. Um, I, I, I'll probably try and put a little bit of work into that watch order guide for that this weekend. Um, I also will have to set up my Google AdSense account. Uh, because I, I'd set up, but I don't think it's actually set to give me money yet. So I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> uh, so David C. with $10. That's how they do it, isn't it? Uh, Stress VK. Lore may have freed Moriarty and joined forces. Uh, well, the question is, what the how's How'd Lore get here? Last time I checked, didn't Lore get, like, disintegrated or something? What happened to Lore? He was very much dead, right? Or is, was he, like, in a shed in Daystrom? I figured out what they stole! <laughs> right? Because, I know I brought this up in Season 1, isn't it? Lore is in a shed in Daystrom, isn't he? Because I talked about how, um... With, uh, like, Thaddeus and stuff, how they need a positronic brain. You could just h hook up before Lore's head... Lore has been in a shed in Daystrom for, like, decades, and that's what they stole, and that's how you get lore in the season. And yeah, I would imagine Moriarty's probably all in the same one. Lore was dismantled in pieces. Yes, but where were those pieces? Because probably in a shed in Daystrom. That was always the quote-unquote jo joke I made. Um, so I bet, like, they put lore and Moriarty, maybe even in that, like, evil AI room from Lower Decks, and that's what was stolen. And so I, that actually gives me more credit to the idea that this woman, or maybe even these, are they masked people or aliens? Like, this is some sort of champion for AI rights? Stress VK, that's a great theory. Thank you so much. It was, I, I thought so too. Like, I said it, it just, you saw the dots connect. I was like, Lore's in a shed in Daystrom, and then all the dots just like, bam! <laughs> I love it when that happens. Um, I might make a short. That, that'd get views. But, um, yeah. I, I, because I, also Worf has a whole thing about, like, there's no good, there's no evil, only perspective. What if this woman is some sort of AI rights terrorist group? Like, um, God, I want to be careful with my examples here. Um, like, you know, th there are those. There's, like, the people for good, you know, that, like, civil rights movements or um, liberation movements, like, in colonies. Like, we know the Gandhis and the um, MLKs who are, like, the peaceful ones. But you also have the violent ones. Like, what if this is some violent AI rights uh, kind of thing or holographic rights? Um, and that, that I'd love that. Um, I would also kind of suspect Picard is setting up for Star Trek Janeway 7 insert legacy character here show um, in, you know, that portal from kind of season 2 that opened up that might tie to the Dominion and um, just some other things. I've been kind of getting the feel that like, you're not going to address that next season. Like, you're laying threads for future series. Um... But that's kind of my running theory now. Episode 3, we got a running theory. Um, they probably found Moriarty in the saucer section of the Enterprise-D. Yeah, um, I imagine that's where they found it. But then where would you put him? Well, surely Daystrom. 
Because, like, they're the people who could get him out one day. They're the people who keep um, before and uh, lore, I imagine. And, you know, I guess they don't keep the dangerous AI, like um, Peanut Hamper and Jeffrey Combs, whatever his name was. <laughs> but um, that's my running theory now, is this is some sort of AI rights group that... Um, yeah, I got distracted, sorry. This, I think we're barking up the wrong tree now. This kind of reminds me of the uh, T cards. Like the Kren Krenum, was it, weapon? Um, where like Chicote, it was the Year of Hell weapon. Um, where they had all these kind of like timelines and stuff. Uh, but also it could just be a quantum tunneling thing. So I, I don't think this is like see some weird randos from the future. I like my first theory better, Nathan. You look so clever right now. Don't ruin it. Um, moving forward. We talked about this. Yeah. I found it kind of weird as well that Troy's line here was, um, I haven't brushed my hair in 72 hours. And I thought an unreasonably long amount of time on that line. Like... You know, is Troy ever really one for, like, brushing her hair to that extent? And, like, again, I've never raised a newborn, but, like, if that's their biggest complaint, surely you can't be having that bad a time, right? Like, even, I haven't bathed in 72 hours is worse, but that's not even that bad, is it? I, I guess maybe if you've got a baby vomiting all over you, but, like, what was the baby doing in engineering to projectile vomit anyway, like... I guess maybe that's why you'd want to brush your hair. Is there vomit in your hair? Do you brush your hair to get vomit out? But, you know, it's, I thought a lot about that. And also, is that like a... Troy could be stereotyped in TNG. And that feels like a very uh, mundane thing to care about. Is like, yeah, I, I have to brush... I haven't brushed my hair in 72 hours. It's like, okay you haven't slept in 72 hours like you know you seem to be doing everything else pretty good mm. uh let's go through fought fave fave ball was it uh if this all leads to cisco coming back you're gonna lose your shit it's not unless they recast cisco or they gave Cisco an absurd amount of... No, actually, you know how you get Cisco back? Is, I don't know if he's still teaching, but you're like, Hey, Avery Brooks, we want you to play Cisco. He's like, I'm not going to do it. He's like, I don't care how much you're going to offer you. He's like, we'll, we'll donate $10 million to, like, whatever university he taught at. You know, that's... He's his only... Like, that'd probably be how you convince him, because you'd have to do something like that we'll, we'll pay for all your kids education <laughs> but um i the thing it, it was something big like that though i'm kind of worried like could you do it justice in an episode like i almost feel you'd have to set up star trek cisco for that and you're not going to get avery brooks for star trek cisco you're just not but i i don't know that's another video, like, I've got in my mind is, um, I remember when I watched Deep Space Nine, I feel like I've got a pretty clear idea that I'm sure, like, all things Deep Space Nine is absolutely unplanned and un unintended of what Cisco does, um, after joining the Prophets, and I've always felt I should write it down in a video. <laughs> Carlos A. Smith, don't dwell on that scene. It was supposedly to be funny. I did say unreasonably long amount of time, didn't I? <laughs> uh, they didn't want to pay him that kind of money. What kind of money, though? Like, I don't know if there's any amount of money you could pay Avery Brooks to come back and be Cisco. Uh, he's just done with Star Trek. Um, he's, he does teaching. I don't even know if he's, he might be retired now. But he's, I think he's been very clear that he has no interest in coming back. Just VK, I think women with long hair have to brush it every night, like a hundred strokes to keep it from getting too unruly. I, I, I was just, I went way too deep. I'm like, if you got a new baby though, like, if that's your biggest complaint, I'd love that to be my biggest complaint. <laughs> oh. 
Would be cool, though, a true Luke Skywalker moment. Oh, don't get me wrong. Everyone would lose their collective shit. Like, <laughs> if it was Avery Brooks especially, um, I don't know how I feel about a recast. Um, I think I've made my opinions on recasts very clear here. But I, with Doctor Who, uh, big finish audio dramas. Um, I've been watching some stuff. They've recasted some dead actors. Uh, the Brigadier, big person. Um, they they get some of the old doctors uh, that died before the company was founded. And they have other people doing the voices. And I just picked up uh, the first Doctor stuff with David Bradley. Um, and they recast him and all the companions, Barbara, Ian, and Susan. And I've been enjoying those. So I, th I think I'm lightening up to the idea of, like, the recast more. But, like, God, you'd have to do it good. And especially, th there's always, like, weight um, in taking over a role like that. Is the actor, like, oh, my God, like, how can I beat Avery Brooks, Leonard Nimoy? Like, I don't know anyone. But, like, when you if you're taking over Cisco, who was, like, such a huge an important figure for people of color or fathers of color and all that. Like who, <laughs> you, I, I couldn't imagine wanting to take over a role like that. Like that's just so much pressure. There'd definitely be people who want it. Like Whoopi Goldberg is in Star Trek cause she wanted to be like the next to her, the her of the next generation. So to say, but God, that's a, that's one heck of the boots to fill. Recast will not do it justice. I'm sure the person exists, but um, it, yeah, I think we all agree it'd be better if it was Avery Books. See, your wife is calling. Thank you for joining the stream. Uh, it was a pleasure having somebody new. Uh, and I hope to see you in the future. Let's see. Speaking of the future... Uh, I'm so surprised they couldn't figure out a better way to include Wesley and Picard. It's not that they couldn't... Oh, do you mean um, last season specifically? Um, yeah, I, I suspect that's the reason he's not in this season. Um, it was a fight, though, apparently, between... We, we don't know which shows. We can speculate Lower Decks probably wanted him. But apparently, like, many of the shows wanted wesley and all had plans for wesley to like bring him back um and then it kind of came to a head when they realized like hang on you've got a plan for wesley we have this whole story for wesley and like they all kind of got in a big little fight um and i don't know if like kurtzman or like someone had to set out they'd be like look picard's gonna get wesley right like Picard season two, they get Wesley, everyone else go write something else. Um which does kind of feel like the weaker thing, like that that they didn't really do much, they just brought him back. Um so maybe they all had some weak little reference, but hopefully that's not the last time we see him. I mean Will Wheaton's um, you know, he's younger, uh, especially in terms of legacy actors. He is very active in um you know, Trek, he's been active in Trek. I would not be surprised if we see him again um, later down the line. Moving forward a bit. But I would say it'd be kind of odd to make him always showing up. That would make it feel less like Star Trek and more like the Will Wheaton franchise. Like Will Wheaton is some sort of god like watching over all the shows and like stepping in which i guess he kind of is but um it it i i get why they don't want to just put will we'll put wesley everywhere even though they can it, wesley would have to be like q where like one se one show gets him at a time and like once a season max that that kind of have to be how you use wesley but even then, I, Wesley, I don't think, is enough of a character to justify that. Whereas Q could have an episode every season for, like, 14 years. And that, that was great. All right. We talked a lot about this scene. Um, I don't remember too much about this bit with Riker and Jack. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I just remember it was a solid story. Um, definitely. I enjoyed a lot of it going through 
Yeah, there we go. I, I am getting a bit tired of hearing, like, literally everyone being called a legend. Um, in this context, like, I can get it. Um, I mean, it's hard to deny, especially someone like Worf, uh, Picard, it, are at Legends. <laughs> like, just look at what these two did, and Raffi would see Worf as a legend knowing Picard. But, um... Yeah, I I have to say as well, God, does does Michael Dorn's voice actually boom like that nowadays? Because, like, he he had a booming voice, but when Worf started speaking here, I'm like, oh my God, like, why does it sound like Michael Dorn's voice is some omnipresent sphere around him that just projects from all directions? That's a booming voice. I don't know if it was the ship, like, the pa space he's in, because I think it was a bit better. I, I won't say better. Um, it was a bit more natural in the outside, but, like, God, I, I was like, whoa, that's a... That is a booming voice. Uh, and, yeah, he's already... He's got the one-liners back, you know. Decapitations are on Wednesday. But that's also a serious question. Like, did they modify his voice a little bit? Because, my God, that that was a booming voice. I've just today learned what it means to have a booming voice. Like, whoa. <laughs> uh, moving on a bit. It did feel a bit weird. And I'll say, like, the CMO here, um, like, really pushing away Crusher. Like, even if medicine really has changed that much in 20 years, I mean, this was the chief medical officer of Starfleet. <laughs> like, for a time, she was the head medic of Starfleet Medical. I can't remember the position name. And, yeah, she's been going around helping people since. Since that point. And it's like, yeah, that, that, that one did feel a bit weird. I guess she's angry at her for putting him in that situation, but this is a remarkably informed Lower Decks. <laughs> I must say that. Yeah, here's, here's the one. I think this was the thing I forgot about I was going to talk about. When Jack came up here um, with character motivations, he's like, he knows what's wrong. If Jack had just said, I know what's wrong. I know how the, like, Vatic is tracking us. And even if that guy doesn't believe it, literally just explain or attempt to explain it, it probably would have resolved the situation. Um, but look at Jack's lifestyle. Look at how he views people like Picard. Look at how he views Starfleet who, in their last encounter, he's actively tried to capture him. Not this, like, the last encounter Crusher mentions, and then, um, who is, he's spent his whole life helping the planets he thinks Starfleet has abandoned. Yeah, he doesn't trust this, like, authority bureaucratic system. He's like, all right, I'll do this myself. Um, and he goes off, I guess, to get seven, like the other rebel, so to say. Well, the Fenris Ranger. Like, yeah, it's irrational, and it prolongs the story for the sake of it, but it's also a consistent character motivation. Carlos, Michael Dorn had weight to his voice, uh, and he had met... What? When he had met... Sorry. Michael Dorn had weight to his voice. When he had meat in his diet, he is now a veggie for health reasons. There was a slight change in hearing it today. Does that affect your voice? <laughs> but but that's the thing. I felt like he had more. Like, Michael Dorn's voice in that ship, and I think it probably is like it's supposed to be a confined metal space. It felt omnipresent. Like, it wasn't coming from Worf. It was coming from everywhere. It was like the universe speaking to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, that... Unless you're saying he became, like, vegan halfway through filming, and then um, he kind of lost some boom in his voice, but... God. That that was just, like, whoa, that's a boom. I, I love this weapon, too. It feels kind of weird Starfleet would develop it, but, um... I mean, I guess any weapon is really only as dangerous as how you use it. Um, even a nuke is, like, if you really do just use it as a deterrent, it's technically not dangerous at all. <laughs> um, okay, I hear that, lol. Thank you, Carlos. Um, but, 
I, I'm like watching it. I'm liking all the interesting things they're doing with it. Yeah, it's someone watched Doctor Strange and went, I have an idea. But, you know, everything is inspired by something. Um, quantum tunneling is a real thing. I have brushed up against the um, theory effect. I don't know what you call it in the past, but so long a no to not really be able to explain it or remember it and just kind of go like, yeah, I think it's sort of like this at like a sci-fi level at least. <laughs> but I guess quantum and macro scale are two words that um, don't really go together <laughs> historically. But um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. And you can kind of ask like, man, this would be useful in Discovery you know, in, like, the series set in the future. But um, I, I would not be surprised at all after seeing what's unfolding here. This feels like a banned weapon that everyone just gets together and be like, yep, this is banned. Like, you know, subspace mines, those are banned. What's the radiation that the um, uh, scimitar uses? Like, that was banned by everyone. Um and, you know, even when you have, like, the Romulans and Klingons at the height of their aggressiveness banning weapons like that, I'm like, sure, this is just a thing we do. I think this is getting banned. Moving forward a little bit. Um... Oh, yeah, this bit felt... I didn't like this as well. It's... I don't know. It's, it's something hard to describe, but where, like, their solution is to punch out the guy. Like, I get why Jack would do it. But why would Seven roll with it? Why isn't it when Jack tells Seven, she's just like, even if she thinks Captain Titan is in charge, um, not, ah, Thoron radiation. Thank you, Carlos. Um, even if Seven thinks Captain Ty Titan is in charge, try and contact him or even Riker and Picard and be like, I know how they're tracking us. <laughs> like, they just waste so much time I guess trying to prove it or trying to handle it themselves. Um, which seven was like that. Now that I'm describing it, Voyager seven of nine was like that. Um, Fenris Ranger seven of line probably had to do it, but I feel like she should know better and kind of know to go, you know, tell someone and be like, this is Starfleet. Like, Whatever they feel about you, they don't want their ship to be destroyed. Like, you're on the same side in this situation. And, I don't know, especially punching out the guy. I mean, I guess uh, in the past you would have done a nerf pitch, pinch. Uh, neither of these people can do that. You could write it. You could say, screw it. Jack knows how to do a Vulcan nerf pinch because, you know, he works in the shadows, but he's still not for violence. You know, that heck, that could have been a nice thing to do. But um, I guess it's more systemic. It's a consequence of um, Picard often painting the Federation is in the actual government, the bureaucracy, the, the body of the Federation in Starfleet is an obstacle and an enemy is, is less of an organization or even like the embodiment of the ideals. Um, it's, it's a lot more either we're an organization that exists or we're an obstacle. Carlos, if Anna had the security officer, uh, adding assault to her record would be bad. Yeah. Um, you could maybe say, Oh, well seven, um, Wait, do you mean Annika, by the way? I assumed you meant Seven, but her name is Annika. Um, but anyway, if Seven, um, like, Jack kind of punched the guy. Like, Seven wouldn't have known that was going to happen. I've also just realized, is Seven in heels? Or is Jack in heels? <laughs> um, but anyway, how come, at, like, Seven wouldn't have known? Do you think Seven might turn to the guy and be like, why the heck did you do that? We're going to go to the captain and tell him what the problem is. And then we can have literally everybody on the ship try and find the leak and sort it as opposed to these two people, you and me. Um, you know, that that's why I have a problem with Seven doing it. Because, yeah, I don't know. 
let's jump forward a little bit. Um, yeah, and it was with um, LaForge as well. The comment about how um, people didn't think I'd belong. I belonged. Um, it's more like. I just don't like the Starfleet depictions like that. And it's another little point where, like, Starfleet is the antagonist, the obstacle. And I'm not against that. Um, I mean, the organization itself has been in the way in the past. In First Contact, they didn't send the Enterprise-E um, to help fight the Borg. Um, you know, they the Starfleet orders have been an obstacle in the past, but... In culmination with how else the Federation is depicted in Picard, and um, I don't know the ways, kind of the casualness of this, it just all kind of builds to paint a picture of a Starfleet that is is the enemy, or just like some organization with all the flaws and um, just kind of random bureaucracy or nonsense of any organization. Which isn't inherently bad. It's realistic, you could probably argue. But when Starfleet has always been, and I think should be, the physical embodiment of those ideals, the Federation ideals and the Starfleet ideals, you can't have that. Or else the ideals suffer. And a fault in Starfleet is a fault in those ideals. Um, whereas in the past, you know, where they had all these same things, you know, the bad Starfleet officers, the bad mills, whatever... Because Starfleet was still the physical embodiment of those ideals, it was oddities. And we look back and we laugh, like, how come so many Starfleet officers are evil? Whereas in this context, in this greater world that Picard has, we look at it and go, why is Starfleet dystopian? Like, it's kind of the same things, but because they're taking place in different worlds, we look at it differently. Jerry R. is only five foot eight. I thought she was taller. Evidently, you're going on some sort of Google spree. Um, is, it, is it the heels? I will have to pay attention to that now. Do, does the Starfleet uniform have heels, and is that gendered? Uh, going through... Oh, I think they're changing... Another good note on that changing effect is I actually thought earlier, I think it was this episode, someone did the face thing. Yeah, when Jack got beat up. Um, I was like, oh, that kind of looks like a changeling, but like, you know, they're not gonna do the changelings. I just kind of brushed it off. Um, it was kind of a weird moment where like, if you're a fan, especially after he said like, how long has it been since you been to the Great Link, or even like when, as I said, when Jack Crusher got beat up, you'd already know what these are. Th that's kind of a big moment, but then they kept building to it, and it's like, oh, it's the Changelings. But like, if you don't know what a Changeling is, if you don't know what the Dominion War is, you're like a purely modern fan, um, that build-up's gonna be nothing to you. And if you're a new fan, you you got it at great link. Like, it, that's the last possible point. Um, which, maybe it's just hard to do. I, I can think of other build-ups, like Doctor Who, when they revealed the Master for the first time in the modern series. Um, I can say kind of the same things about, but... Uh, yeah, anything else I want to talk about? Oh, yeah, we introduced the mystery box. Did you saw that? They showed us the... Um, the top of the box, you know, we've now seen the top, um, with the little weird red door, come find me. There it is, come on. There we go, now we got it. Um, I don't really know if I have anything here. I don't recognize the van red vine effect. It's a bit weird that it's seven. Um, but yeah, we got the top of our mystery box now. Uh, can't wait to open it, I guess. I really it, we saw the top not a lot to talk about unless someone in chat noticed something I didn't I'm thinking now does seven have like a hologram or like some artificial form of herself anywhere because not that I can think of unimatrix zero but like that's about it here we go um yeah, I think we're probably wrapping up then. Yeah, 
So let's see. Let's go to chat. Carlos A. Smith. Actually, it is a dress boot. Low back heel. Uh, I wouldn't have added any height to her, but may have tested it for screen and saw she was too short in some shots. It, it feels weird, though, because, like, any kind of heel is highly impractical, and... I don't know that they're all bad for your feet, but that doesn't look like it'd be good for your foot feet. Um, and I don't know if it's if I'm I'm never like the gendered things in the uniforms as well. I'd I'd love it though. I, I'd be down for it if we saw some men walking around in them too, like it was a scant sort of thing. Um, but like, why would an organization like Starfleet put its people in heels? They very regularly, um, you, you might not know this, but Starfleet officers often find themselves in rugged, unexplored territory with um, little infrastructure. Um, you might say places where no one has gone before, but yeah. Just VK, I feel like the Great Link is trying to reach out to Jack. Are you saying Jack is a changeling? Um, that'd be a direction. <laughs> like... Well, there's the question. Why do they want Jack? Um, I think the this Changeling faction is in it just to take down the Federation and Solids. Um, you know, that's probably their stake. I, I guess if it's a holographic rights issue, holograms aren't Solids, kind of by definition. Um, I You could make little logical leaps, especially in a terrorist organization, to justify um, people like Lore, you know, androids. But I, it's still, like, I I don't know why they'd want Jack. I, I think Jack may have done something. Like, he has a line of, I didn't want any of this, which could be, I tried to leave the Titan to save you all. But there, I don't know, there's also something that felt like, and in, in his look, like, I've done something. I I stole something. It, it could even be that um, opening scene we saw in one of the episodes where he gave weapons to both sides of a uprising. And that has somehow led to this. Like, Jack has done something. Um, Jack has done something morally compromising, and now we're here. Um, and it's like a revenge thing then. But... I I don't know. Carlos A. Smith, that is not Starfleet standard, and in this sp specific star Starf bleh bleh, that is not Starfleet standard, and in this specific, I assume Starfleet, it seems anything almost almost anything goes. Um, it could be standard for these uniforms. We really haven't seen much, and I don't exactly look at their feet much. Uh, it is a pretty wide screen. But I, I I suspect it's probably just a part of the uniform. And yeah, I think I've probably wrap wrapping up, unless anyone else has other comments here. Let's just put this back. Um Yeah, I I am very pleasantly surprised by that. I very much enjoyed it. I would not be at all disappointed. This is sort of a quality floor or sort of a quality bar for the season. Um, but yeah, the characters were all handled very well. Um, if we leave Picard in this state, I'm, I'm happy, I think, with everyone. Um, of course, Riker's still got problem where his family doesn't want to be with him because he's practicing the trombone, as we all know. He's trying to play jazz on the trombone, and so his family wants some time away. That's the reason. Um, that's, that's just, you know, we know, that's just, I, I don't think we have to discuss it anymore. He's just playing the trombone. <laughs> Honestly, I'm joke about that, but I would love if they baited some sort of thing like that with Trouble in Riker's family, and then they never address it again. And then the last episode, there's like a post credit scene where he's like, Honey, I'm home. And then they're like, Oh no. And it's like, you know, they don't want anything. It's like, they like they're packing up they're gonna leave he's like well, where are you going were you going on a trip it's like you know they're gonna leave him but then he's like but you know i was so excited he bends up and he like picks up to practice again and then he's got a trombone and he just plays it so badly and they bolt like that that's how i'd that's how i'd write it um i yeah i'd love that 
Stress VK, some suspect Geordi might come to the rescue, but I want the Nebula to be a Type 3 energy civilization. You will have to remind me which one that is. Um, I felt like it was probably alive, just given the biological readings. I mean, that's an obvious conclusion. It could be misdirection, but if Geordi comes to the rescue, that would feel contrived. That'd be the first time I think they've introduced someone and it doesn't feel natural. Um... Like, why would Jordy know they're here? Why would it be Jordy who comes anyway? Like, um, if he's like, it's just a little too much. I'd be like, eh, you know, you maybe could have come up with something better. But the the natural way to bring Jordy in is um, an engineering problem. I guess you could say the Titan went missing. My daughter's on that ship. My mom died to a missing ship. You bet your ass I used every power I had to be the captain who went to search for the Titan. Actually, yeah, I, I suspect it'll be something like that. That's how I'd write it, because that gives him a reason to be Geordi, as opposed to any other captain in the Federation. Um, yeah, my daughter's on that ship. My wife died, and we they, it's not my wife. My mom died. They still never found out what happened to that ship. Um, the Hood, was it? Horatio? I don't remember. But, um, yeah, I was going to make sure that wasn't going to happen to my daughter. And that's why I'm the captain who went. That's exactly why he shouldn't have been the captain to go. But, uh, no, for search and rescue, I think maybe maybe that was a good choice. Uh, type 3 is like 10C from Discovery. Uh, thank you. Um, I know the scale. So that's... What's that? A Dyson Sphere? It's, um, type 1 is the whole planet. You can harvest all the energy of a planet. Type 2 is all the energy of a star. Is... No, 10C can do a star. Or is type 3 a galaxy? I, I can't remember. It... If you're not aware, it just... If you Google type 3 civilization, it'll probably come up. But it's a scale to measure how advanced a civilization is based on how much energy they can harness. Um, but I think it looks like we're coming to a natural wrapping up point. There's no more theories in chat, uh, or at least no more relevant discussion. Um, how long did we go? An hour and a half. Well, that's a healthier length. Yeah, I'm going to give us a bit of time for chat to post any thoughts or try and distract me down a rabbit hole, but yeah, very enjoyable. Um, I would love more of this in the series. And, yes, Stress VK, civilizations that have control over at least an entire galaxy and theoretically are able to harness all the power available in that galaxy or those galaxies. Yeah, I'm not sure if 10C is type 3, um, like 2 point something, I might say, but we'll see. I give this episode uh, a good rating. Let's see, number 4 can go excellence. I'm really happy, I will say, that um, the chat is with me it seems generally you you all seem to have thought this was a good episode um because we've all collectively been kind of negative um so far more on the negative side than positive i'd say for picard and uh it's been a worry i actively am trying not to attract the people who will just hate anything and it's one of the reasons i stopped season two was i felt i was growing an audience that was just the haters um, but, like, for completely irrational reasons. Um, but I'm very happy to see that we can be like, no, that one was good. <laughs> like, yeah, we have problems with the other ones, but this was a good episode. Great episode, Stress VK. Good. Um, I'm not gonna check what the Reddit has to say, um, because I think we've probably covered all the theories, and I think we all know the Reddit's gonna say that was a great episode of Star Trek. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm very happy um that we can go on this roller coaster of emotions. We have to be honest about everything anyway. Yes, we do. Um it's just we've proven it. It's kind of like a democracy, right? You're not a real democracy until the party or like group or whatever in power changes. Like, you know, Russia's been a democracy for 
what, 20, 30-something years, and it's still the same group in power, so they're an unproven democracy. It's, it's not until you really change over, and this is where we've, we've proved ourselves as a democracy, <laughs> that we can't, we're, we're not irrational haters. We can change, well, we can have varying, uh, what's the word? Um, nuanced opinions, <laughs> that's the word. Mm. So yes, I will wrap it up now. Thanks for watching.